Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, I'm Mike Stone. I'm uh, an emergency physician and uh, VP of uh, Education and Sonography at Butterfly and uh, excited to host another uh, image review. Today we're uh, super fortunate to have Dr. Kevin Bergman and Kevin, it's great to see you. Um, nice to see you too. I'm going to, I'm going to let you do your own introduction. So I make sure that I get it right. So Kevin and I have known each other a long time. He's a phenomenal <laughs> sonographer, family medicine doc, um, and, uh, and just a great focus educator. He does run, um, I don't know if it's Gussie or Goosey, but G U S I Gussie yes. G U S I, which, uh, which is a, an ultra, online ultrasound education program, um, that I encourage people to check out. I'll let him give you the URL and everything. Um, but Kevin, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Say hi. Yeah. Yeah. Hi there, everybody. Um, Kevin Bergman. I'm uh, very fortunate to work at uh, Contra Costa Family Medicine Residency up here in Northern California, a little smoky out here in Northern California at the moment. Um, but um, yeah, really, really a wonderful place. Uh, I am the co-director of the Global Health Program there. We have a large Global Health Fellowship and uh, the co-director of our POCUS program there as well, in addition to co-founding and co-running Global Ultrasound Institute, which we call GUSI, which is an ultrasound education organization aimed to really um, educate any, any physician or any clinician anywhere in the world um, uh, and to, with a focus on family medicine and a focus on residencies uh, and a focus on longitudinal mentorship and scan review and feedback and accompaniment over time. Because we found that doing introductory courses for the better part of a decade. That's just kind of like the very beginning of the journey. Um, what people consistently asked for was just more feedback, more mentorship, more kind of uh, longitudinal stuff. And so that's what we started, Gussie. So it's been really wonderful. We've got over a thousand people learning on the platform in over 15 different countries and growing day by day with multiple residencies around the world. So training their faculties, kind of focusing on teaching the teachers to really to really kind of um, get the multiplier effect uh, for a point of care ultrasound. Yeah, amazing. Um, the, uh, if people wanted to find uh, Gussie, what, um, what, where are you guys on the web? Uh, GlobalUltrasoundInstitute.com. There you go, GlobalUltrasoundInstitute.com. Um, um, yeah, it's amazing how coaching, um, whether it's you know ultrasound or nutrition or fitness or mental health or whatever uh, is, is um, really just such a great proven approach to getting people up to speed with competency. And um, you and I know we, we see eye to eye on, you know, you can learn a lot about ultrasound by watching some online videos or going to some lectures, but it's that bi-directional feedback where you're scanning and getting some feedback on your scans. And that's really what we're, we're trying to, um, to do sort of, uh, you know, no pun intended globally here is we're going to have you run through some cases. We're going to yeah. look at the images, see what could have done, what, what could have done, been done better, what was done optimally, how to optimize your image and try and give folks those tips and tricks that they could do to really improve their competency. Um, so thanks for joining us and uh, we, let's, uh, let's get started. Okay. Sounds good. I'll uh, share my screen right now and hopefully we can see this. I here. Gotcha. So here, all right, perfect. So here we have a first case. Uh, this is from uh, an outpatient context and, and a patient who's 38, who um, is a cashier, a mom of three, and was coming in to see her doctor because she had a, a real annoying kind of swelling and pain in her right armpit for the uh, just past few days. It was bothering her very much. And um, I, I bring this case up because this is a pretty straightforward abscess. It was like an end up being an infected cyst but I bring it up for a couple of reasons. One is that just the point of care ultrasound can make just a huge difference in helping guide uh, a, a successful procedure. And part of that is knowing sort of your, the extent of your target, how deep it is here in our hash marks. This is just under two centimeters deep. And I direct your attention to the bottom of the screen here. You've got this large pumping vessel, which is the axillary artery here which the, the wise primary care doctor said, you know what, I'm not gonna go any deeper than two centimeters here. I have no interest in getting into this large vessel. Um, and, and for uh, just another reason, this is kind of a, a little more a heterochoic cyst it would end up being like a, a, um, an inclusion, epidermal inclusion cyst or sebaceous cyst and was not like a classic abscess, which would have been a little bit more anechoic. It was more kind of heterochoic and it ended up looking like very sort of old 
bad cheese whiz, not the kind you want to put on your Philly cheesesteak, but uh, just the really thick, tenacious stuff and not kind of a gush of pus as the provider was originally thinking. So um, just kind of helping make the procedure more successful and uh, reduce complications. And yeah. I was just going to add, it's a great case. It, you know, the, the sort of avoidance of the big vascular structure during these even minor point of care um, invasive procedures is so critical. Um, and, and just getting that, that confidence to know, you know, I know that everybody knows from, you know, first year anatomy that there's a big artery and multiple veins right there under where this axillary cyst or infected cyst is, but having visualization on it just gives you the confidence to say, okay, I can take a scalpel. My scalpel blade isn't longer than a centimeter, centimeter and a half. And I can, uh, I can adjust the length with the, the little uh, safety cap on it and make sure that I'm going exactly as deep as I want. Exactly. Exactly. Sticking in the, in the soft tissue area, um, I, I wonder how many of the people here today have ever thought for sure that they were going to get pus on an IND and they got blood. I don't know if anyone, if there's any hand raising that can be done in this kind of thing, but I definitely have in the pre ultrasound era for sure. I think all of us have. And I just wanted to share this case of a, of a 28 year old young guy who I saw not long ago who had this rash on his belly. He went to urgent care. They gave him Clinda. Uh, didn't get any better. He went to his primary care doctor. She tried an aspiration with an 18 gauge because thinking he was going to get pus and she didn't get any pus. And now he's kind of exasperated coming to see me a few days later. This is his third interaction with the healthcare system. He's got a larger 10 by six centimeter um, area of cellulitis there with a real tender spot in the, in the middle. And I was kind of thinking to myself, well, you know, um, I want to make absolutely sure that if I'm going to IND this person, that there's going to be pus there. Um, and I plop the ultrasound probe on. And this is what I saw. And any doubt that I may have had that this was just cellulitis completely evaporated in that moment because what I saw here is a sort of circumscribed kind of cystic structure that's basically anechoic. There was a little bit of cellulitic kind of cobblestone changes around it, but it was very clearly an abscess. And I turned the screen around to him and just showed him, was like, hey, this is definitely pus. We got to open it up. Um, it needs to come out and you're going to feel so much better right afterwards. And he was completely on board with the plan, numbed him up. I indeed it super successful. And uh, he was a happy camper. So I think that is really low hanging fruit, honestly, for anyone practicing medicine in any context who sees soft tissue infections. Um, the literature shows that, you know, we're actually not that great at distinguishing cellulitis versus abscess. I know it's the consummate clinical diagnosis, but the truth is that um, the, the meta-analyses show that when you use point-of-care ultrasound, uh, the sensitivity for abscess is about 97%, and the negative predictive value is like 0 0.04. And so what that means to you as a provider is that if you don't see this kind of a thing, like a cystic circumscribed structure, you can be pretty darn sure there isn't an abscess there, and they're going to be okay on antibiotics. So... Anyway, I don't yeah, have any thoughts on good. that one. Absolutely. So um, a couple of thoughts. Uh, first thought, just programmatically, I see that we have a, a Q&A question that's come in and I'll, I'll field those as we go along. But for folks who are watching, feel free to submit those in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your uh, Zoom window. Um, so I'll get to the question in one second because it's kind of tied to this. You know, if we look at this clip and um, Kevin, you're going to drive the mouse for me. But if we mm -hmm. if we outline the abscess itself where Kevin's outlining there, it's largely anechoic. It's black, right? There's some internal debris, but for the most part, it's black. If you look just deep to the abscess, you can see how bright it is. Um, and that increased um, uh, posterior acoustic enhancement. So basically as the ultrasound beam goes through tissue, it gets what I like to call kind of a free pass through fluid because ultrasound travels so well through fluid that it doesn't attenuate. And the, the, the amplitude of the wave that comes back, the intensity of the wave is higher than it would be if there was solid tissue in the way. So one way you can tell a fluid filled structure versus a solid structure is whether or not there's posterior acoustic enhancement from it. Um, and in this case, 
it's not really that reminiscent of say a lymph node, but lymph nodes shouldn't have posterior acoustic enhancement, whereas a fluid filled structure will. Um, the question was about the prior clip, which we don't have to go back to, we can if you want, um, but was uh, um, whether a reactive lymph node would look similar. And you can see there's a little posterior acoustic enhancement if you compare the tissue just deep to this uh, cyst to the tissue say on the right of the cyst on screen right, um, which is darker. Um, and that, is a hint. The other hint is um, it's almost got like a like a lattice like um, mm. structure on the inside. You'll see that with hemorrhagic ovarian cysts. You'll see that in inclusion cysts like this. Um, and you, uh, if it were a um, a lymph node, a lymph node is actually pretty homogenous. It's a it's a smooth hypoechoic, so sort of like darker gray echo texture with a little bright hyperechoic hilum. You'll see like the, the stalk to the lymph node coming in. And if you put flu, uh, color flow on that, you'll actually see color flow in the hilum. So that's sort of how you could distinguish a, a lymph node from a complex cyst or an abscess um, using ultrasound. And while we're at it, uh, uh, Richard, hey Richard, uh, says farm body may also have shadowing. Absolutely. So you'll often, you'll often see shadowing off of a farm body as opposed to posterior acoustic enhancement, but yet another, you know, it's these, we think in lung, we think about looking mm -hmm. at artifacts, but when you're looking at soft tissue and other exams, sometimes these artifacts like acoustic enhancement, shadowing, et cetera, can really help you kind of suss out what you're looking at. Great points. Great points, all of them. Yeah, I definitely use a color box. I'm in the habit of putting just a, a, a color box right over the area here, exactly for that, making that distinction between lymph node versus abscess or cyst. And typically, if it's a kind of a fresh, angry or abscess, you'll see like a kind of a halo or hyperemia on a color box around that abscess. Uh, whereas for a lymph node, you'll see the color light up right in the pelvis of the lymph node. It looks like a little kidney typically. And, yep. and so that is a you know, th way to distinguish those two. And, and as always, like, you know, we, we think let's get a bunch of cases together because we'll only have a couple of things to say about them. We'll go quickly. <laughs> but here we are in the second case. We're still talking. Um, uh, the One other pearl that I'll give you is um, before we look at this, it, we can keep it going. Uh, so yeah. question is, what is a color box? When you when you put uh, when you enable color flow uh, or color Doppler on any ultrasound system, you'll get a box, which is a sample volume where it's taking the do displaying the Doppler shifts in color. Um, so that's just the physical like on the the screen, you'll see a box, you can adjust the shape and position of it. Um, one last tip on color flow on abscesses is as Kevin's pointing out, you get that often like a almost a ring of fire like this hyper or hypervascular rind around this angry abscess. Mm -hmm. That's not enough to make you say I'm not going to do an incision and drainage. So as opposed to you put it on, you see like a big pumping vessel like that first clip. That's a different story. But yeah, abscesses, everybody's IND'd them. There is going to be some blood involved in opening up an abscess. Um, but so seeing hyperemia in the wall by itself isn't going to... Uh, um, isn't going to dissuade you from cutting. And last question I'll take for right now is, could you repeat what you said about posterior acoustic enhancement? That is the term posterior acoustic enhancement in the simplest terms just means um, the tissue deep to a fluid filled structure is, is more hyperechoic, is brighter than it is deep to a solid structure. Um, and that's, that's just because ultrasound passes through that fluid filled structure easily. And the waves that come back tend to be higher amplitude, more intense. Okay, let's move on. Perfect, thank you. All right, this is a case of a, of a patient, a 66 year old patient who um, has got a history of, of COPD and she has multiple flares per year. She also got hypertension, obesity, obstructive, obstructive sleep apnea, she's on CPAP. And she had a, she'd been feeling short of breath for the past few days. And so she had a telehealth visit and uh, thought, well, it's probably a COPD exacerbation why don't we give some uh, albuterol and, and prednisone? And she said, you know what? I tried the albuterol, but it kind of making me feel a little bit worse, actually. So the doctor got a chest X-ray, and the formal read on the chest X-ray said, um, concern, for, there was like a little haziness in the left lower lobe. Maybe it's an infiltrate. So she also prescribed doxy, but really didn't get any better. And then she ended up getting a little bit worse. And so she presented herself to the emergency department. And there, the physician... Uh, took a look at her heart with point of care ultrasound. And a couple things I wanted you to know this, first of all, this is an apical four chamber here uh, for orientation's sake. This is the left ventricle. 
mitral valve, left atrium, right ventricle, and right atrium. And here's the left ventricular output track into the aortic valve right here. And if you notice, one of the kind of the focus questions that we want to answer is what, what is the ejection fraction for this patient? Is it normal or abnormal? And if you kind of look at the septal wall and the, the, the free wall, the left ventricle, left ventricle here, it's kind of just not really giving an enthusiastic squeeze. And another clue to the diagnosis is this anterior leaf of the mitral valve in a normal ejection fraction, they're gonna, it's going to go up and hit a high five. It's going to give a high five to the septum right here. And there's a really a pretty far distance between this anterior leaf of the mitral valve here and the septum as well. Another clue is this left atrium is enlarged in comparison with the right atrium. So Mike, I don't know if you want to say anything else about that. I've got a couple other clips to go with it. Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, it's a, it's an, it's an apical four kind of verging into an apical five. Uh, just if we're, if we're going to be uh, technical um, and nitpicky, which is what Good we point. like to do on these things is just point out all the little intricacies. The aortic valve looks a little thickened and sclerotic to me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, you know, may you know the movement of that anterior mitral valve leaflet could be influenced by aortic insufficiency if you've got an abnormal aortic valve it's going to kind of push the leaflet away from the septum so 100 percent, i look at the anterior mitral valve leaflet in a parasternal long and in an apical just to get a sense of its its movement and does it look like it's really coming up and, and slapping or high-fiving the septum so um but generally just looking at the lv qualitatively um you know, when you first start off here, it's really useful while you're scanning just to put your finger onto the screen in the center of the left ventricle. And then just look around at exactly where, where Kevin's put the place, the cursor there, and then look around at the walls and see, are all the walls coming and thickening and moving towards your finger? And you can look kind of segmentally all the way around and say, you know, is there a forceful squeeze towards the septum? And when you do that, I mean, the proximal septum here down towards the aortic valve, it doesn't look like it's thickening much moving forcefully at all. There's some ballooning of the, of the apex there. I mean, it's a very, um, it's, it's not that, mm -hmm. you know, nice sort of squeeze that you're going to get from a healthy heart. So I'm definitely suspicious that, um, albuterol, uh, <laughs> doxycycline and, uh, probably not going to be helpful for this patient. I mean, now granted I'm being, you know, I'm being snarky, which is my way, but, um, you know, if, if there's, you could have someone who had known systolic heart failure who also had COPD or a pneumonia or something else that's causing their symptoms. So of course we don't want to rush to a diagnosis, but um, I wouldn't start heparin and see if we could get the third incorrect <laughs> diagnosis treated for this patient. Um, but the, and then the last thing I just add before you move on is that left atrium. You said it's enlarged. Um, you can use an ellipse measurement uh, 20 square centimeters is a good cutoff. So if you wanted to have a, you know, you've looked at a ton of echoes, you look at this and eyeball it and you say that left atrium looks big. But for someone who's uh, starting off, when you get that biggest view you can of the left atrium, so you know you're getting a, a nice uh, um, slice of it and you're not getting the edge of the atrium. If you trace out with the ellipse tool on any of the ultrasound systems, you can measure a circle um, and that's greater than 20 square centimeters. That's a hint that you've got left atrial enlargement and that's gonna push you towards considering things that cause left atrial enlargement. Absolutely. Awesome pearls. So that physician was thinking, hmm, this is probably not a COPD exacerbation. And the patient, by the way, did have an echo anywhere in the system and had no history of heart failure. Hmm. So it takes a look in the lungs. And uh, in the lungs, there's typically two, two patterns that we can see. There's a pattern that looks like this, uh, with, which is pathologic, which we call B lines, with these, which are these kind of like vertical strobe lights in the fog kind of appearance that emanate from the pleural line right here. This is the pleura and they go all the way down to the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, versus an A line pattern, which I'll show you guys in a minute on the next slide is horizontal lines. And that just means that segment of lung is aerated lung. This means that there's basically not air in this portion of the lung. It could be pulmonary edema, like in this case, it could be any kind of interstitial edema, uh, it could even be pneumonia but it just means it's not air. So that is clue number two to this patient's diagnosis right here. And I like the way that you mentioned sort of what A-lines and B-lines mean too, because, you know, they're not, they're not uh, pathologic. I mean, B-lines are pathologic, but I think a lot of people when they first learn lung ultrasound think B-lines equals pulmonary edema. And Absolutely. I think the, the, to me, the, the, 
the most straightforward sort of introductory way to think about it is a lines means that one segment of the lung you're looking at is would look like a clear lung. Um, now, granted, if the, there's no sliding, then it would look like just air and maybe you have the pneumothorax. But sure. um, but a lines for the most part, if the pleura is sliding, as Kevin's pointing out there, that just means that's going to look like normal lung on an X-ray versus assuming you're X-ray sensitive enough. Um, versus um, B lines is going to give you um, an opacity. Right, and that opacity, if we think about it as an opacity, then we have a broad differential and we think this is pulmonary contusion, this is pulmonary edema, this is interstitial fibrosis, it's pneumonia, it's ARDS, it's all the things like our our mind gets working about what it could mean. Um, So that said, that echo plus diffuse B lines, Mm. maybe small pleural effusions, it's gonna be heart failure. Um, It's gonna be heart failure. And then icing on the cake is the patient's IBC, uh, which given the, habits of the patient was a little, a little bit deeper, but I, what I want to point out is that it's just really not collapsing very much with the patient's normal respiration. It collapsed maybe 10, 20%, and it ended up being, it's hard to see on this, but it was about 2.4, 2.5 centimeters in diameter. So by any measure, kind of the magic number on that is usually 2.1 centimeters. If it's greater than that, then you have what we call plethoric IVC, and that certainly supports and kind of really nails down the diagnosis that this patient is actually having new onset heart failure. They've got poor squeeze, a big LA, they got a bunch of pulmonary edema or opacity in the lung, which in this case is pulmonary edema, and they make a congestion in their inferior vena cava with increased CBP. So all that together kind of ties it up neatly in, in a package with a bow on it for a new onset CHF, they ordered a BMP, it was over 1,500 and got her admitted in the hospital. Yeah, so a few things to, to add, it's a great case. It's definitely sort of like a, a pattern to burn in to your mind as you're learning ultrasound. This, uh, this dysnic patient with you know, a myopathic LV, just a poor squeeze, bilateral B lines, plethoric IVC, it's a pretty classic presentation. Um, it, it performs um, just slightly better than say like jugular venous distension and peripheral edema and S3 and Rawls. Um, and when I say slightly, I'm again being snarky. Um, interesting uh, randomized controlled trial from um, the American Heart Journal, this uh, cluster heart failure uh, study recently where they looked at patients yeah. in a primary care, I'm oh, sorry, in a cardiology outpatient clinic where um, they uh, either did lung ultrasound or all of the things I just talked about, S3, JVD, peripheral edema, weights, et cetera, um, and adjusted uh, diuretics as a result of what they found. And patients getting routine lung ultrasound, so not even the echo and the IVC, but just routine lung ultrasound um, had a lower rate of, uh, they had a composite endpoint, but the, the bulk of the effect was in urgent visits to the clinic for decompensated heart failure. So this is a really great, highly sensitive um, modality to look for pulmonary edema. I'm going to run through four quick questions from the group, and then we'll okay. get on to the next slide. Um, it's worth, no- uh, Mohammed says it's worth noting that uh, one single beeline is not indicative of pathology. That's absolutely correct. So our criteria really is three or more beelines in one interspace to count as, as an abnormal um, amount of beelines in that interspace. If we look at the clip Kevin's displaying, there's almost innumerable. They're, they're mer- in some areas merged to almost mm-hmm. get like a white lung look. Um, mm-hmm. But that's a great point, Mohammed. Uh, if you see one beeline, don't start panicking that you've got something abnormal there. <laughs> um, would you have an increased or more drastic, this is from Dan, uh, A-line presentation with um, an acute COPD or asthma patient? You know, I don't see A-lines more prominently in asthma or COPD. I do feel yeah. like lung sliding may be a little bit less pronounced in a bad COPD patient with bullous mm-hmm. emphysema. Have you seen any difference in the A-line pattern? Right. I haven't really. No, I haven't. I, I, I usually, I mean, shortness of breath and d- dyspnea is it, just one of my very favorite applications of point of care ultrasound. And honestly, kind of breaking it down and keeping it as simple as possible. Oftentimes, it's literally the difference between this, being able to distinguish this from this, you know, A's from B's. And COPD, so there's a differential here, right? And that's, I think that's what the, what the, um, the person's getting at. So like, if, so, if you just see an A-line pattern, it doesn't mean the patient is normal. It means they could have asthma, they could have COPD. It's an air trapping problem and getting more air. Um, and this, in this, the point you made earlier, this is pulmonary edema in this case, but it's not necessarily pulmonary edema. But I guess the, the power of this is 
if you ever see a patient, whether you're in clinic, you're in the ER, you're in the hospital, and they're short of breath, and they've got a history of CHF, COPD, and pneumonia, and you look at an x-ray, and it's like looking at a Rorschach test, and you don't know what is what, is what literally just go to the bedside and take a look at their lungs. And do you either have this pattern, or do you have this pattern? And if you want to add in your echo and IVC, awesome. But I think in most cases, when I'm in that clinical situation, I do my, I do my lung ultrasound and my cardiac echo, and I'm very confident when I leave the bedside, maybe a minute and a half later after I've done my exam, that this is either COPD or this is pneumonia or it's CHF. And I don't need to treat them for all three. And, and that, by the way, is before a BNP has ever been ordered or a lab has been drawn or an EKG or a check system has been drawn, which is why this is so powerful in an outpatient clinic setting where you don't have those kind of resources. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one question about measurement of the left uh, atrium done only in an apical four or done in a parasternal long axis. You know, typically I do these in an apical four. Um, you, if you measure it in a parasternal long axis and it's bigger than 20 centimeters squared, that's still abnormal. So you can't make it abnormally big from that slice. Um, can you link to the paper from the American Heart Journal? Yes. Uh, while Kevin's mm -hmm. talking about the next case, I'll dig that up and post it in the chat. And what else uh, can give a beeline besides fluid pathology edema? Really fluid pathology, scarring, edema, contusion. Um, and what if you have three views with one beeline in each view in a symptomatic patient, still normal uh, or still an A-line pattern. So you're really looking for more than three lines per interspace that you're examining. Um, okay. okay. And thank you uh, for folks on the webinar. You're asking great questions. We appreciate it. Those are awesome questions. Uh, by the way, I love that paper. And they saw a 45% decrease in urgent care visits for heart failure just by using low ultrasound. Yeah, so that's, that's a amazing. game changer. So how about this next case? Let's transport ourselves now to rural Uganda. And we've got a five-year-old kiddo whose mom said that he hadn't been eating much. And he's a big eater, so it's really abnormal for him. He hasn't been eating much for like four or five days. He's had a little bit of a cough, just not feeling real well. So mom says she comes from very, very uh, remote place. And it was really, really hard trip to get to the health center, the rural health center, where they were lucky enough to see somebody there who had actually been trained to use a point of care ultrasound and had a handheld ultrasound. And this is what they found when they took a look at the kid. And I bring up the case up for a couple of reasons. One is that the kid's presentation wasn't that dramatic. Actually, the vital signs really weren't that remarkable. He was afebrile, normotensive. Um, his oxygen saturation was normal at that time. And uh, I think he probably could have been fairly easily missed. At the, at the time, they had, um, they had blackouts there, like in a lot of places in Africa, and the chest x-ray was not functional at that time because there was no electricity. So the clinician did a lung ultrasound, and I don't know if you can appreciate this, maybe I can pause it for a second. Um, and I'll bring it back here. So if you see, this is the pleural line, and then all of a sudden it takes a real big dive way down here, and it's like a big, huge divot is out of it. It's an echo poor um, area right here that is a consolidation. I'll just run the clip right here. And it's right on top of the diaphragm. It's in the right lower lobe. And these little white specks right here are air bronchograms. So just like you see on a chest x-ray, this is a sonographic version of an air bronchogram. So putting all this together, this is a consolidation that is uh, pneumonia in this five-year-old kid right here. And given the fact that the kid wasn't eating very well, they came from such a very far, a far away and the size of the consolidation, they decided to keep uh, the kid overnight. And good thing they did because he actually kind of decompensated in the hospital, he spiked a fever, pressure dropped, his O2 sats dropped, he needed some oxygen for a couple of days, but then he turned around, turned the corner as, as kids often do, and by day three, he was happy as a clan and discharged uh, from the hospital and did really well. But I bring it up because I think that um, this is a, a kind of diagnosis that could have been missed in this kid, uh, and he could have become one of the statistics for pneumonia and, and they're pretty grim. There's like 92 kids a day, excuse me, per hour that die of pneumonia around the world, 800,000 per year. So um, 
anyway, that was a, a case. I don't know if you have any thoughts or comments. Mike. Yeah, it's a great case. I think, I think you were going to, um, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I think you, you had some numbers for us around pneumonia. Um, I mean, obviously lower respiratory tract illness in, in children under five in, uh, in um, the developing world uh, and low and middle income countries is a huge source of mortality. So, um, and we, and, the only thing I'd want to talk about was what you got up here is whether okay. can't I just can't I just listen or do an X-ray? Um, <laughs> isn't that just as good for pneumonia? And the truth is, is it's just a superior test. Lung ultrasound is a superior test. There's been multiple meta-analyses now over the years. Uh, one big one I know in the PEDS literature saying that sensitivity was in the low to mid 90s uh, for pneumonia. About the same in the adult literature. And that's far superior to a chest X-ray. Chest X-ray misses about a third of pneumonias. The specificities are about the same, but the sensitivity is 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 really much greater. And it's just it's just a better test and doesn't, you know, require any radiation, especially for a little kiddo. And you know, if if I can um, also kind of translate this case into like uh, maybe like a not a resource limited, but a, a resource, uh, you know, not resource limited context like what we live here, in, like in the states. And if you've ever been in a situation where you're listening to a kid's lung, the parent brings him in, they think maybe he's got pneumonia, maybe he needs antibiotics. Um, you know, just do this, do a lung ultrasound on the kid. And, uh, and I involve the parents in this process. I say these, these lines, these horizontal lines are good, A lines, and these vertical lines right here are not good. And I have, I scan all the lungs and they're looking at the screen and we're talking about it. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's so great. You got a lines all around. This is a better test than a chest X-ray, which it is. And your kid doesn't need antibiotics today. Um, that's wonderful because they have a viral URI. So it's a very, very different application of the exact same scan in Africa or a resource limited environment versus what we most likely see here. A hundred percent. And, and, you know, interesting, I uh, go back to that clip just for one second, cause we did get one question that, that I'll, uh, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll answer uh, the, exactly that one. The, um, the, um, there's also just how, like, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, how often do we, you know, trudge through the hospital electronic health record, um, to, you know, get through that, that, uh, that slow wi that slow Wi-Fi connection to pull up an x-ray to show a parent. Right. There, there's also, you know, whether it's normal or abnormal, just per allowing patients and families to participate in the imaging and see what we're seeing and how we're thinking about it, I think has a huge um, patient experience uh, bonus that that we could spend a whole hour just talking about focus and patient experience. Um, one of the questions was, um, is, is it more hyperechoic? Like, is there posterior acoustic enhancement here deep to that, to that consolidation? And I'd say no, largely because you would think physics wise, yes. And it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's more of a fluid filled as opposed to air filled and it should transmit better. You really, in my opinion, can't call posterior acoustic enhancement without adjacent tissue to compare it to. And because mm -hmm. the lung is all artifact when it's air, we don't know uh, whether it's more hyperechoic than the artifact adjacent to it. So it's a good question, but I probably wouldn't, I, I don't tend to think of posterior acoustic enhancement in lung imaging. Um, is that a fairly uh, classical presentation of pneumonia on ultrasound? Um, or do you normally just see a focal area of pathologic V-lines? Think, Focal area pathologic B lines for sure. And someone who's low bar or more advanced, then you know, we tend to see this echo pore tissue consolidations. But typically it's fo focal B lines when you catch it a little bit earlier. Yeah. Agree. So earlier for sure and more substantial. Um, although in this case, I, I have definitely seen uh, consolidations like this on ultrasound with completely normal chest x-rays. Um, so mm. I, I don't, I, I wouldn't want people it. to take away. Yeah, I'm sure you have. I wouldn't want people to take away that, you know, you're seeing an early pneumonia when you see it on ultrasound. Sometimes you can yeah. see an advanced one you'd miss. Patients often don't have one uh, from Allen, don't have one lung pathology at one time, can have multiple pathologies. Totally true. Uh, ultrasound tells you the size of the effusion better if you're thinking of tapping it. Also true. We're probably not going to have time today mm to go through how to sort of grade the size of a pulmonary of a pleural effusion, but that's a hundred percent correct. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the sensitivity specificity on ultrasound versus chest X-ray. Um, is there the same difference in clinically significant findings? Uh, that's from Brad. 
That's a great question. Um, you know, lots of pneumonias in children under the age of five are viral. The majority are. So in terms mm -hmm. of clinical outcomes, I have not, and I'll, I'll ask Kevin to weigh in as well, I have not seen an outcomes-based study on, um, you know, patient-oriented outcomes around lung diagnosis of pneumonia versus chest x-ray diagnosis of pneumonia. I think that I mean, the overall mortality from pneumonia and is, is relatively low um, as compared to some other diseases. You'd have to have a pretty massive trial with chart review to be able to do that kind of study. So a good question. I don't know the answer. Yeah, yeah really good question. No, I, haven't, I haven't seen that kind of study either. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that pulmonary edema, though, 56% yeah, on chest X-ray. I know, I know. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So should we move on? Yeah, let's do it. Let's get out All of the right, lungs. Let's do it. Okay, so we're going to get out of the lungs. We're going to get into a knee, so into kind of a bit of musculoskeletal. And just wanted to sort of do a side-by-side -side comparison of a patient who does not have a knee effusion. And I guess your clinical question at the bedside is, right, does this patient have a knee effusion? Sometimes, depending on a patient's habitus, um, uh, it's, it's not a totally straightforward answer. And so here is a patient with no effusion. So we've got the patella here at this right side of the screen, and you've got this kind of wedge of hyperechoic stuff, which is actually a fat pad and connective tissue. And then you've got overlying that a quad muscle and a quad tendon right there. And this little stripe of anechoic is actually just articular cartilage. This is a younger patient with zero arthritis. That's usually the first thing to go in arthritis is that articular cartilage. And so this is actually not an effusion right here. That in comparison to this on this other side where you have the same thing, patella, quad tendon, and then this whole ginormous anechoic area right here, like a body of water that's above the patient's femur right here. And that is a very, very large knee effusion in this patient with actually psoriatic arthritis. So that's the difference, no effusion versus effusion. And by the way, you're in a musculoskeletal preset with the probe and a sagittal like longitudinal orientation um, just at the kind of pre-patellar space to make that yeah. diagnosis. And this is like and, a seconds, a seconds exam, right? You yes. just like throw it on, uh, take a quick look, make sure you're seeing the structures that you want to see, but this is not a lengthy exam. This is time no. consuming. Definitely not. Definitely not. And if you wanted to plan, for example, um, for an, an, an injection or aspiration of this patient, let's say if you saw an effusion for some patients like this, uh, I would just like, like to ask, has anyone ever felt unsure if they've done a knee injection, if they actually got in the right space? Have you ever kind of walked away from that procedure that that's on? You just weren't totally sure. And I would submit to you that I, mean, I certainly have pre-ultrasound. And in a patient who, like this one, who has a BMI over 50, it becomes even more difficult, really, to, to know and to, to, because landmarks are so tough to palpate. And so in this particular case, just for orientation, you've got all of this is adipose, this entire way, right, soft tissue right here. Here you've got um, quad tendon. And then there you start to get this little wedge of anecho anechoic fluid right there that the operator was able to kind of squeeze the... Um, uh, the, the distal quad to kind of bring out that tissue, tissue plane and bring out that little effusion. And then here is that uh, fat pad and the femur way down here. So you can see the needle coming in and kind of like really trying to poke through that, that joint capsule. And sometimes it, you really have to give it a poke and it's a super dupe for health. You see the swirl of anesthetic going into the joint space and kind of filling it up in the right plane there. And Sometimes you just have to be a little bit bold because you're hitting this resistance of a very thick and joint capsule with somebody with bad osteoarthritis. And you got to just, it's really nice to just see yourself right where you are and getting just that little extra nudge of confidence to say, okay, I know exactly where I am. I'm going to just push right through. And then you have the added assurance of seeing your fluid going exactly where it needs to go. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Love using ultrasound for uh, joint injections for arthrocentesis. Um, I would I would throw in just to make it a little bit conversational and and uh, and controversial. Um, when we <laughs> talked about soft tissue and abscess, um, I think we 
you because you can do an ultrasound doesn't mean you always should do one. And I mm-hmm. think, and I know you know this and that you believe For this, sure. but when somebody comes in with a big pointing abscess that's fluctuant and obvious, you don't need yeah. to do an ultrasound on no. that patient to do a successful mm-hmm. IND. Um, likewise, you know, a patient with the habitus like you have on that top right image, if they've got mm-hmm. a glottable big knee effusion, I might yeah. just go and tap that without, um, without sure. ultrasound. But one of the cool things about knee um, arthrocentesis with ultrasound is, you know, for the for folks who are watching, notice that that Kevin's placing the um, the needle and the and the probe cephalad to the patella, um, and this is not typically a landmark based approach when you get into that super patella brosa, but this is absolutely my preferred way of doing it as well. It is way less painful for patients when you're away from the bony patella and you're up into the distal thigh. And obviously, you're going to come from lateral to medial to avoid mm-hmm. vessels and all that stuff. But um, this is a, a from a comfort perspective, even if it's an obvious effusion, if I'm going to tap it, I'm still going to go from the super patellar aspect. Absolutely. And the literature, there's, there's been a few large studies on this. This is one of the most recent ones. Uh, which is a meta-analysis that essentially showed more, it's more accurate, less patient pain. You get more volume out if you're doing arthrocentesis and they've got less pain after two weeks. Um, so, um, yeah, we can, we can move on to the next case if you want to. Or yeah, let's do it. Comments. Let's do it. I mean, okay. I, I, this, is, this is something where I, I will say, like, completely talk the talk and walk the walk. I tapped a I, septic knee um, that was sort of a, an unusual presentation of bounce back after a tap that was um, sort of borderline but negative cultures two days before and then came back with worsening pain, and I did this exact same technique um, to tap it. So this is, this is my it, go-to it way really for ha- knees. Yeah, I think you're totally right. I mean, if it's a clear cut case and it's a total, it's an it's clear cut cellulitis or abscess, there's no reason to do an ultrasound. If it's like yeah, great landmarks, there's no ways you don't really need to throw an ultrasound on there. I've, at this point, I'm kind of in the habit of it, and I like to see where the biggest pocket is, so we're going to have the most success. But it's really not necessary, especially if you feel really comfortable. It's for those cases that where there's just a wisp of an infusion, and you're really not confident you're going to be able to get it, or with someone with unfavorable body habitus, that this really this pointing ultrasound just really shines to do your procedural ultrasound guided. For sure. Um, switching, switching gears here to the abdominal aorta. And this is a, uh, a patient who's a, kind of a salty dog, Vietnam vet, not much for doctors, nothing personal, he says, um, but doesn't like going to the hospital, comes in every quarter for an inhaler refill. And he came into his primary care doctor, uh, in a rural area of California and said, yeah, I just want my refills. And she said, Hey, you know, mind if I just take a look, you're, you're between 65 and 75 and you meet the indications from the U S preventative task force recommendations. And you're currently still smoking. He's got hypertension to take a look and see, we can see your abdominal aorta. Well, it turns out gentleman had a near six centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm. And just to kind of like go through it here. So you've got skin, soft tissue, looks like peritoneum here, and then a very large kind of round structure here with what looks like a large amount of transmural, or excuse me, mural thrombus right here with a lumen here and a little teeny bit of that posterior acoustic enhancement that we mentioned before. It wasn't quite deep enough to see the vertebral body, but that's usually the kind of the, the, the best landmark to know that you're dealing with the abdominal aorta is find that vertebral body. And the only thing that lives right on top of that is the abdominal aorta. Another pearl on this is that always when you measure these measure outer to outer. And so you could see how if you didn't do that, if you just measured the lumen, you'd be like, oh, this is what is this like two centimeters? No problem. And you would miss this ginormous six centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm. So those were a couple pearls right there. And I would also just add that, you know, most patients who have these don't know they have them. Um, we do in the States and a lot of countries, a really poor job of, of screening. And it's, it's something that can be easily done in clinic. And if you catch one of these ticking time bombs, then, and they get fixed, you've, you know, you decrease the mortality by 50% from dying of the aneurysm. Yeah. Such a, such a, you know, easy to get dissuaded because so many of them are normal. Um, but that's exactly the purpose of a screening test. Right is to detect to find these ones where you're really you're you're going to save a life by um, 
you know, find two of these and you've just saved one of those people's lives from their aneurysm. Exactly. Um, so there's not really that much bang for the buck you get in medicine um, as, as high as detecting an asymptomatic, um, you know, significantly sized abdominal aortic aneurysm. So that's a great case of calcification in the near wall there that you can see the superficial wall, anterior wall. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. just a, uh, and and all the right uh, all the right pearls the uh, about uh, measurement and including the the mural thrombus looks like you got a little bit of the vertebral body kind of peeking in from the left side of the screen there oh uh, yeah there uh, yeah, a, yeah, a little there bit back and I think that's that, that's a good point in the sense that you know the more diseased aorta uh, um, you have the more likely it is to be like ectatic and and maybe slide off of the vertebral body and you may lose your landmark there and then um, you know two planes. Right. So this is obviously we're not showing all of these entire exams, but you, you want to make sure you're looking at it in two planes and that you're getting a, a real good 3D sense of what you're seeing. Um, and then um, I think that's probably it from, uh, you know, the iliacs. Interestingly, yeah. some people say if you find one, you should you don't necessarily need to go look at the iliacs all the time. But if you find mm-hmm. one, you should look for iliac aneurysm because there is uh, a significant association of, of comorbidity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think we got frozen. I'm going to, um, I think, continue on here. So we've got a case. Our next case is a patient who comes in with shoulder pain. So um, this is uh, a 55 year old patient who's uh, got four kids and who has been having a lot of difficulty with her shoulder. And the primary care physician who had recently trained an ultrasound went ahead and did this scan of the patient's shoulder. And what we're seeing here is um, just, I'm just gonna pause it just for a second, just to kind of orient. So you got dermis deltoid here, muscle kind of body looks like this. And then you've got this bright line right here, which is the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And there's actually a little bit of fluid in that space. And then deep to that is a rotator cuff tendon, which in this case is subscapularis right here. And then deep to that is going to be the humeral head with the bicipital tendon sitting inside the bicipital groove. So, um, in this particular case, really by, by looking at the ultrasound, you're able to make the diagnosis that the patient had fluid in that subacromial cell deltoid bursa. So that is bursitis. And probably more significantly, they had, you see these kind of like calcific uh, round kind of things that are embedded inside that subscapularis rotator cuff tendon. So that is calcific tendinopathy. And uh, that's what the, that was the cause of this patient's shoulder pain. It actually had on and off chronic shoulder pain for a long time, had failed conservative therapy, ended up getting um, from a sports medicine doc, uh, kind of a, an irrigation technique and a kind of barbitage to break up some of these cal- calcific areas and a subchromial subdeltoid bursal um, ultrasound guided uh, cantalog injection and actually ended up doing really well. Hey, you're back. Hey, I sorry. I had a Wi-Fi moment a second ago. No problem. Um, no we problem. had a. Uh, there were a couple of questions. Um, one was, does this count as AAA screening if you do it in the clinic? Oh. back on the. Oh, we're back on the AAA. Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. You have to fulfill a, a few. It depends on the state and the payers' uh, recommendation, but uh, excuse me, their requirements. But absolutely, it does. Um, you. you you had a very much of a positive screen in this particular case, but typically the screening protocol is from the xiphoid to the umbilicus in two planes, as Mike uh, mentioned, starting out in transverse, it's much easier. And then switching to longitudinal and, and, and you don't want to miss a, a saccular aneurysm. Fusiform are much more common, but you can also have a saccular that you could potentially miss just in transverse orientation. And then you need an indication um, and, and a, a kind of a wet your read and um, that the fact that patient met, uh, met you know, indication for that it absolutely counts as screening. I know in California, Medicare will pay, I believe it's $118 or something for office-based point of care ultrasound AAA screening. Awesome. And then the last question on the order that I missed as my Wi-Fi died was, mm-hmm. uh, are you able to see this in, uh, in only in thin patients? And I would say, 
um, pressure is the key. Um, mm -hmm. Slow graded compressor, uh, compression will move bowel gas out of the way. I have seen abdominal aortas in obese patients. Um, it is a challenging exam when you have a non-fasted patient who's um, overweight who, or obese who's coming in, but by no means is it uh, impossible. And the good news is when you have an abdominal aortic aneurysm, it displaces all of the overlying bowel gas. Totally. And they tend to be way easier exams when they're abnormal than when they're normal. Um, but yeah, lots of pressure. And if it is a scheduled screening outpatient visit, um, just have the patient MPO uh, after midnight mm. and you can go ahead and get a much better exam when they come in. Totally, totally great. All right. All great points. What are we? What are uh, we moved on to? We were on. We, we kind of went through. We, we went through this case. Yeah, we went through. It was a uh, burs, bursitis. We had fluid in the subacromial uh, subdeltoid bursa right there, and then this uh, calcific tendinopathy. And I kind of talked through that for awesome. for a minute. Um, yeah, uh, we can uh, we can move on to the next one if you want to. Yeah, for sure. Oh, okay, good. Um, We've got a few more minutes. And then if, yeah, for kind of the setup for the subacromial subdelta bursa injection um, would be kind of a patient lying on their opposite side and uh, going in plane, in plane orientation right there. Um, it's such a, it's such a small, and I, I would say in my experience, most docs that I know do this a landmark based and I used to do it landmark based, but it's such an incredibly small target you're going for. It's like two or three millimeters. This happens to have a little fluid to pump it, to plump it up. But honestly, it's super duper easy to just get into the rotator cuff if you're going to inject catalog, um, which is not a good thing, or to just dump it into the deltoid. So really nice to do that under ultrasound guidance, that particular injection. I've got another case here of, um, of a patient who really, um, really nice guy, 55 year old guy who works in construction. And he came to his primary care doctor because he's like, I can't feel my thumbs. I can't feel both of my thumbs. And it's been a while like this. Um, he hadn't had insurance for a very long time. He just got insurance. And so this was like his first medical visit in a very long time. He's having a lot of difficulty gripping tools. And as he tries to use his hands more during the day, the more numb his thumbs get. And it's just, he's thinking that he's gonna have to go on disability and he's pretty, he's pretty bummed out to be honest. So this particular patient um, has uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Pretty clearly had a pretty classic, you know, he's got classic history and a classic physical exam findings and he had failed conservative treatment. And uh, he had tried like the night splints and he's done a ton of NSAIDs and um, he wasn't interested in any kind of surgery, but he was open to an injection. And so the primary care physician went ahead and did an ultrasound guided uh, carpal tunnel injection. And kind of, you can see right here as I run the clip again, you're seeing some of the landmarks of uh, flexor carpi radialis over here. This is the median nerve sitting right under the retinaculum right here. This whole thing is the carpal tunnel with all the flexor tendons in them. And this is the ulnar artery on the ulnar aspect right here. And then you can see that needles coming in in an in-plane orientation, you can see with this picture, and it just dips right under that retinaculum and gives a little bleb of, of the medication. You can see a little billowing right there, decides to redirect a little bit, and there is in a really good plane. So under that retinaculum, which by the way, is only maybe two or three millimeters below the skin surface. So you, that's kind of, I think the key part of the procedure to ensure, ensure its success is that making sure that you're deep to that retinaculum. But there's just so many structures here in this carpal tunnel. And you definitely want to do the ulnar, you want to get near your ulnar artery. You want to go through a flexor tendon so I think ultrasound guidance in this is a very, a very clear benefit. Um, and you have, fact, you have one question oh, yeah. from, uh, from Richard, yes. which is not a, not a question, but just a comment. Good shot, <laughs> which it is. Um, <laughs> okay. And uh, what, uh, just I'm anticipating a question, but I'm also curious, you know, this is not something um, I typically do in emergency medicine practice. I mm -hmm. do lots yeah. of nerve blocks for lots of other reasons. Is this, um, is, is this mainly like hydro dissection? You're just kind of freeing it from the, from the carpal tunnel and giving some space, or is it a catalog injection or? Canalog. or Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah, can be diagnostic just, you know, just with Lido, just to make sure you got the right diagnosis. Uh, but typically, it's either 
saline, Lido plus Kenalog. Yeah, as gotcha. a therapeutic injection. Yeah, no doubt awesome. about it. Um, we have, and, uh, we've got about yeah. five minutes left. Let's talk about this slide and, oh. um, and then, okay. let, or, and then maybe let's do one more case. We had, I just want to say we had a bunch of great submissions <laughs> from people to go through. We're not going to have time this time, but I will save them if you submitted clips and I was going to present them anyway. I, I got you guys. Don't worry. We'll do it next time, next month when we do uh, image review again. Okay. Um, but go ahead, keep going, Kevin. If we, sure, sure thing. Maybe, maybe, well, this is just a study essentially showing that, that uh, all shun guided versus landmark based steroid injections of carpal tunnel syndrome, you essentially, the number needed to treat was five in order to prevent one treatment, one patient from like get needing retreatment in a year. And they followed these patients actually over 10 years. And they found with ultrasound guidance, there's like, they needed to get a steroid shot way less frequently in that, in that intervening year, or they need to have surgery even way less because it kind of makes sense. It's such a teeny space. It's so easy to miss it. And then if you're right, exactly precise, then they're going to have a better outcome. So that was awesome. that study. And then the last case, I guess the last one we have time for is I think also pretty bread and butter, low hanging fruit kind of a case. And this is a patient who's 44, um, remote history of kidney stone and had some left-sided flank pain that was really bothering over the past two or three days. He kind of thought it was a back strain um, and tried some Motrin and Tylenol. That didn't really help. It wasn't super positional. Came in and saw his, uh, his primary care physician and had this ultrasound. And what you see here is the kidney. Here is the cortex all the cortex, the kidney, here's the renal pelvis. And the renal pelvis, the key to this is you're looking for hydronephrosis. And hydronephrosis shows up as like blackness in the renal pelvis, basically an anechoic area here. And it's supposed to be all white because it's full of fat and, and connective tissue and that shows up as white as ultrasound. But if you've got uh, some kind of obstruction, like from a stone downstream, just like when your kitchen sink gets backed up, you can't exactly see where the backup is, but you know it's not draining. And so you've got urine that's being made by the kidney, but it's not draining. And so what happens is it backs up and backs up and splays out this renal pelvis and kind of starts to get into these calyces here. In this particular case, you've got mild hydro, but if it gets more severe, you get more and more of this blackness and to a point where it gets like, looks like a bear claw, or even if it's really severe, it can actually kind of thin out the cortex over time. So this is mild hydronephrosis. And <clears throat> um, the biggest, I would say, false positive for hydronephrosis are the renal vessels, which run through that exact same place in the renal pelvis right there. And so the way that you can assess for that is to put on a color box right here, right over the renal pelvis. And you see that this area of black actually doesn't really light up. You can see a couple of little small vessels intervening here, maybe from some movement, from some noise, but essentially that area of anechoic part of the renal pelvis um, does not correspond to vessels. And so that means this is true mild hydro because the patient was a smoker and I think had hypertension, they wanted to take a look at the abdominal aorta. So they just swung over from the left side of the flank, looked at that abdominal aorta and saw that that patient's Abdominal aorta was a normal caliber sitting right on top of that vertebral body right there. And this is the IBC. So um, with a, a, a UA that showed blood with a history of, of this patient who's had kidney stones in the past, and it didn't really sound like musculoskeletal, I think you're done here. I don't think this patient needs to go to the emergency department. I don't think they need a CT scan. Um, the evidence shows that I mean, first of all, 90% of all comers with, with kidney stones pass it on their own. That's number one. Um, and there's good evidence to show that um, the degree of hydronephrosis corresponds with kind of the size of the stone. So uh, if you have either no hydronephrosis or mild hydronephrosis, <clears throat> then there's, a, I think, like an 88% chance on that last study that I saw um, that you've got a stone that's less than five millimeters, which is almost certainly going to pass. So essentially what you can do is save this patient what I think would be probably an unnecessary T CT scan. And if you're worried yeah. about the alternative diagnosis that you might be missing, if you want to read one study on this, it's probably this New England Journal of Medicine Randomized Controlled Clinical Trial from 2013, which basically looked at POCUS versus radiology ultrasound versus CT in patients who are suspected to have kidney stones. And essentially 
there was no statistically significant difference in uh, another alternative high-risk diagnosis or complication. And this is, by the way, all in the setting of a kind of, of a 10 times increase in CT scanning for patients with suspected kidney stones with zero difference in outcomes, with zero difference in complications, urological instrumentation, or admission to the hospital. And that's from like 1997 to 2007. I'm sure the number is even bigger now in 2020. But essentially, we're just scanning and scanning these people. And by the way, these people have recurrent stones. So I've seen many patients, and I'm sure you guys have too, who've had like, they've been to multiple different emergency departments and have gotten like 15 CT scans and they're 40 years old. Um, and, and that just, you know, we know that the increased radiation dose corresponds with an increased risk of cancer later in their life. So I just urge you guys to ultrasound first when you got a patient with suspected kidney stone and uh, do no harm. Love it. Um, two quick things. Um, Kevin, I'm going to ask you to stop your screen share for one sec because Annette it. had a question about um, transducer position for that and for the renal exam. And I'll just show a quick uh, image here. This is, this is where your transducer is placed. So you've got the transducer in the right mid to anterior axillary line with the indicator up towards the head. Um, and that's going to get you your, your view of the right kidney in a longitudinal plane from the, uh, using the liver as an acoustic window. So um, I wanted to show you that and answer your question. How do you bill that if you're billing for point of care ultrasound? That's a retroperitoneal, a focused or limited retroperitoneal exam for renal. Um, that's from Rachel. So that's how you would bill it. And then... Um, how about checking for your ureteral jets uh, to ensure that you're not obstructed? Um, you know, generally, if you see hydronephrosis, you've got some degree of obstruction. Um, ureteral jets, to me, are kind of a fun thing. Um, I haven't, much in the same way that I don't think hordes of renal colic patients were dying before CT scan. I don't think hordes of renal patients, uh, renal colic patients are going to be having complications when you don't look for ureteral jets. Um, I would say on rare occasion, um, really classic stone story um, and having a hard time telling if I think there's hydronephrosis, I might look for a jet, but I'm really down there more to look to see if I see a stone at the UVJ mm -hmm. than I am to look for same jets. Way. I'm not sure about you. Same. Yeah. I tell you um, Okay. Um, listen, we could go literally all day, but Kevin is, uh, <laughs> is giving us uh, his time. And um, I want to thank you so much. These were great cases. I know you had a bunch more in store and we're definitely going to have to do another one of these together because you've got great. so many great, uh, so much great experience to share. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. And we will be, uh, we'll be reconvening at the end of, uh, of, where are we? End of August now, end of September. We'll be doing a, another image review session. And um, thanks again, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thanks a lot.